Amanda, welcome. Thank you very much, Camillo, for the kind introduction and, and the hint to um, unmute myself. I've got that. Um, this is a, a this is a this is a first for me. I don't think I've done a curatorial walkthrough of an exhibition that I'm not physically in. So I'm going to be relying on you um, considerably, Camillo, to help us walk through the gallery space. Um, I'm completely delighted to be here and I'm also looking at my notes on my phone and of course that's turned off. Um, I especially want to thank the artists in the exhibition, Adrienne Votzel, wave Adrienne. Um, Adrienne is a New York-based artist who has specialised for the last 30 years in robotics and conceptual arts and has produced an amazingly um, beautiful project for um, this exhibition. Chloe Bass, also based in New York, New York born and bred, Wave Chloe, you look gorgeous, a conceptual artist with a really deep focus on social practice, runs a fantastic program um, at CUNY New York based on social practice in New York City. Francesca de Rimini is joining us from Adelaide in South Australia. Francesca lives on Ghana land. Um, I've lived on Ghana land with her in the past. Um, also unceded territory of the Ghana people and indigenous um, nation of Australia. And um, Francesca has been working online since the early 90s. Um, forgive me for uh, admitting that to you, to, to everybody else. She's a poet. She's a founding member of VNS Matrix, um, uh, uh, um, an important um, artist collective who coined the term cyber feminism, arguably. Um, and has been working in an online environment for, for a very long time. Uh, Lenny Silverberg is here with us too. Lenny, wave for us. Lenny is a, a, a painter, um, an educator. He's based in the Bronx, New York, and in Los Olivos in New Mexico. Although I believe in our current times, you've spent less time in New Mexico and more on the Bronx, Lenny. Um, Susan Weil finally is uh, also a New York native artist, a painter, a poet, a printmaker, and um, infamously also a very early member of the Black Mountain Artists Group where she did training too. So thank you to all of you for joining us tonight for this online curatorial walkthrough. Um, it's you as the artists who are my inspiration as the curator for this show. It's my view that artists don't just make work, they're record keepers, documenting the social and cultural determinants of their times. Daily Ritual includes work by all of you that result from your varied visual and text-based, maybe journaling practices that are contemplative, yet both personal and deeply political. Um, you're each at once social researchers, agitators, and visual storytellers, most importantly, who peak our imagination and prompt us to think about better futures. So I'm gonna just share my screen because I have some slides that um, Camillo and I pulled together today. that show the work in the gallery while I walk through the gallery and, and talk to your works briefly before I actually get Camilla to walk around the gallery, just so that we can see some clear installation shots. So this is a, um, a, a view of, as you walk into the gallery, there's Lenny's work on our left, Francesca's work uh, behind that, uh, Chloe's on the rear wall and, uh, and Adrienne's work is on, on the left wall as we're looking at it. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important is that all of your works are testimony to, in fact, almost five decades of diaristic practices, but you approach your work in very different ways. I'd also like to acknowledge that you're all serial collaborators in one way or another. So as far as I'm able, I'll try to acknowledge that in my introduction to your works. And Adrienne See No Evil consists of semi-fictional fictional Bain texts in her work, yet the stream of consciousness of a personal diary. And I hope to talk to her about that um, when we're in the gallery 
in her installation, no two books are the same. Um, they have drawings rendered from Alberta Sieber's Cabinet of Natural Curiosities, obscuring different parts of the text in each book. And each book contains 20 images that are so-called targets in AR speak for animations in the book. The resulting 20 individualized books were produced by small editions. Um, the installation includes beautiful animation of Adrienne's drawings by Joshua Tuthill, an AR app developed by Jeff Krauss, um, an algorithm that randomly um, that randomized how the images, images are overlaid in the text was written by Grace Poltinger, and the books were bound at small editions by, by Sarah Nichols. So here's a close up of some of the drawings. And I can't wait until um, Camillo can show us some of the animations on the drawings when we have an exhibition walkthrough. This is the book Binding by the fabulous Sarah Nichols. Sarah X incidentally also has an exhibition on at the Centre for Book Arts at the moment that's incredible. So if you're able to get there, you should see her exhibition as well. She's a wonderful book binder, but an artist in her own, own right too. Here's a close-up of Camillo looking at one of the books. So you can see that the drawings obscure the text and you can't see all of the text. And it's still of um, Josh's animations too. Chloe Bass's Sky No Filter, a no filter here at Centre for Book Arts includes text, video, and a chat book that very quietly but poetically captures the political uncertainty of 2016, 2017. A moment when I remember looking at the sky with Chloe in Brooklyn quite often. The chat book was produced by Double Cross Press. And I'll talk with Chloe about the text when we're in the exhibition, I hope. The project started as an Instagram project, but quickly became something very different. Francesca de Rimini's Ghost Fields is a very early work of hypertext, linked images and texts that explore her personal epiphanies, cultural histories of place, interwoven with narratives developed in, collaborate, in collaborative text-based online environments where she's been working for many years. The, the residency where Francesca realized this project, Ghost Fields, was um, in the Slovenian artist Marco Pelchan's Macro Lab on Rocknest Island, which is just off the coast of Western Australia. And it was part of the exhibition called Home at the Art Gallery of Western Australia, organized by curator Trevor Smith, who remains a friend of mine and now also lives um, in Salem, Massachusetts. The installation at Center for Book Arts also includes sound works by Michael Grimm, incredibly beautiful sound works that I listened to for a long time yesterday, Francesca. It was lovely to hear them again. And zines produced by Identity Runners, her collaborative project with the artist Diane Luton and Yezi Trocki. And we will be having a fabulous performance with them next Saturday for those of you who wish to also attend an online performance with them. So this is an image of her website of the fabulous swatch of twigs collected by Diane in Brooklyn, New York, of Michael's sound work and the zines. And what's wonderful about Francesca's work is that it weaves these narratives together between her diaristic practice, the research, the scientific research she was doing on the island and stories of being on the island during the residency. She's also contributed a, um, an etherpad text that has changed daily and it's been really wonderful to log on to that etherpad text each day and receive new texts. Lenny Silverberg's Either Way It's Perfect is a poetic exercise in remembrance. I'd like to say, a series of watercolour paintings inspired by the memory of his late wife, Noni Reisner, and her often seemingly random comments, left as notes, sometimes lying around the apartment or written down by Lenny when she spoke them. Part of her, many of her comments were a product of her dementia in her final years of life. But the works themselves have become an intentional collaboration with your deceased wife, I think, Lenny. Um, 
and the resulting book was designed by Laura Lindgren. So the texts that Lenny would leave lying around or speak to, that Nani would leave lying around or speak to Lenny, then became the inspiration for the drawings. And I find the drawings of the hands particularly compelling in this body of work. Either way, it's perfect. Looking at Lenny, you look strange considering who you're supposed to be. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> And finally, Susan Wells' poem mumbles are an incredibly intimate exploration that bring together images and poems. And I think that poetically, in some ways, speak to Chloe's work on the opposite wall too, to both really quiet and beautiful and poetic work. Um, well, on one level, the poem mumbles are intimate ruminations. Since I think 1984, and um, Susan has also been sending as a daily practice her poems to her collaborators and friends. Initially, these were in the form of mail art, but now they tend to be on a regular diary. I can tell you choosing 24 images from her folders of over 10,000 images was no easy task. And then when I was in the studio with her and her studio manager, Lucy, they drew my attention to the wondrous handbook that was a, 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 that resulted from her long-term collaboration with Anders Tornbrook Gallery in um, Sweden. And we chose to include the handbook also in the exhibition. So these are some close-ups of some of Susan's works. So in bringing these varied works together at CBA Centre for Book Arts and obviously giving the exhibition some kind of curatorial frame of reference, I've been thinking a lot about the difference between a routine and a ritual. And I think what's most important for me is where the intention is of most consequence. Well, routines are just act, uh, actions that we need to do on a daily basis to sustain ourselves. Rituals are practices which have a real sense of purpose. Even Sometimes if in the beginning of the development of these works, the artists aren't entirely sure what the purpose is going to be yet. But in each of these bodies of work, the artists have a practice of reflection and a great degree of vulnerability, I find. And ritual, in a sense, for me in these works, becomes a form of cultural strategy or strategic way of acting in the world, a form of social activity, if you like. My hope is that daily ritual proposes that these ritualistic, meditative and often extremely intimate practices become content for narrative forms of art making, a practice of sequencing or storytelling that speak to our audiences. And I hope we can demonstrate that through our walkthrough in the gallery today. This is a lovely image from Susan's handbook. And I had intended to include an, images of you, an image of you and I standing in front of the wall text, Camilla, that I had on my Instagram feed, but I seem to have forgotten to include that in the slideshow. So I'm going to just have to ask you to do that for us. Camilla, are you with us? Yes, I'm already uh, here in the entrance of the gallery. Lovely. So I'll just follow your lead. Cool. There's the lovely wall text that I have read from in part. The first shelf that we see here from uh, that Camilla is showing us is, the, is, a, is a selection of books from the, the Center for Book Arts has an incredibly beautiful archive and their librarian has made a wonderful zine and curated a selection herself of a, a, a range of books from um, their archive and their collection that all speak to artist book practices.
And then on the end wall here, we have a range of books that influenced my curatorial thinking um, in developing the exhibition. Um, there's um, books around ritual practice. There's a book that is almost always on my bookshelf when I'm thinking about poetic um, uh, <clears throat> exhibition by Elaine Scarry called On Beauty and Being Just, because I think beauty is a really important part of an art making practice. Um, but interestingly, there are so many works in the exhibition that think about a kind of ritual practice that is informed by the internet that I've also got a range of kind of works that look at an internet art practice about uh, the uh, social poetics of the internet, um, uh, including a, you know, a book by the wonderful um, uh, Legacy Russell called Glitch Feminism that also thinks about our online lives as well as our in-person lives. And uh, on our in-person lives, she describes as um, away from keyboard rather than in real life because our online lives are always part of our uh, real lives these days. So as we walk into the gallery, maybe we could take a closer look. Um, actually, Camilla, do you want to go back to the book room and, and, and pick up the copy of Lenny's book so that we can just see a copy of the book itself too? I've got it here too somewhere. I meant to have it on my desk next to me. Either way, it's perfect. Can we read a couple of the inscriptions? The inscriptions have become the titles of the work in the exhibition space, correct, Lenny? Some of them, yes. Yeah. yeah. No, Noni was always great with the one-liner and it continued during her dementia as well. Noni gives me a hand and asks, Lenny, would you hold my holders? I still love that and I still love the hands in the show. The, um, the, there are 45 watercolors in the book from, from about 250 that I did um, in this series. So maybe we could go and look at the selection that we made, Camillo. So of those 45, I think you sent us about 15, is that correct, Lenny? I, I sent 17. You sent 17, and, and then we and, made a smaller chose, selection of that the installation. We composed an installation of those, those beautiful watercolours. So, Lenny, I guess I'd really like to ask you, um, You've been a painter all your life, but when did you know that these incredibly moving watercolors of Donny needed to become a body of work? And um, how did you find a narrative arc for telling the story that you were imparting when you were making well, this? Well, I knew I wanted to save her sayings. I mean, you know, sometimes they would just, you know, they would come out of nowhere and they would knock me out. And, and I would started writing them down. And I really began this series like three, year, three years after her death. I mean, dur during the time I was caring for her, I basically did pencil drawings. And then as I started, um, you know, just, just painting from, from the sketches and from photographs and from memory, um, I, I started to have, you know, uh, 
that definitely an amount of work that I thought, gee, I'd like to connect these with, with Noni sayings. And Laura Lindgren, who, who um, you know, designed the book for me, um, she, we, we had, we had, you know, stu studio uh, exchanges. And while she was looking at these, she said, let's make a book. And, and then we did, you know, and, and so her, her, um, you know, inspiration and, um, you know, and, and pushing me a bit. And it, it, it took over a year for us to, you know, to, to put, put the book together. So how did you find that narrative arc in the body of work? And how did, um, how, why, and how and why did you and Lauren what realize that by, it needed to be by, a book? By the narrative arc, I mean, I, um, um, I often work in series and I'll take one image and explore all the possible ways that I can present and make that image. And then in putting the, the book together, um, certain amount of like, you know, some of it was chron chronological in the sense that, you know, some of the early pictures in the book are when Noni was much more healthy and, and, and more vigorous. And as the book goes along, it, it kind of, you know, shapes, you know, her, her deterioration into dementia. Um, this particular, you know, the, 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 the picture of just the eyes and the nose, that was one of the first images, and that was inspired by um, the night that she died. I was, I was, I was putting her to bed, and and she hadn't really been focusing on anything, and then all of a sudden she just looked at me, and she really saw me, and I saw her, and she focused, and and that was really one of the early inspirations for for for, for doing this series. You know, and um, you know, and, and and like there's like ten of the um, ten ten of the hands by the face with 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 the washed out fade, faded image behind. I mean, it's just I would just explore a, a particular, you know, a, a particular image in different ways. Thank you, Lenny. Is there anything else Thank that you'd you. like to add about the process? Um, the, the process is basically my process, you know, to, to take a theme and, and, and work it to death. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then when, um, when I have no more ideas about it, I then search for a new theme, you know, Pri prior to this, um, I had done a whole series of black and white ink, ink drawings on, on I immigration and, and, and refugees. Mm. So, you know, and, you know, and that was a few years, you know, a process of a few years. So, so I usually work on things for a while. Thank you, Lenny. Camilla, maybe we can move to Francesca's piece. Francesca's installation is in a, what's the name of that shape, Francesca? Uh, uh, a septagon. Or a septagon. A yes, septagon. Septagon. Yeah. Um, which was the shape of the macro lab where you were based when you were doing this research. And your early web-based work, ghost fields and before that doll space, particularly weaves together text from a multitude of sources, from email correspondences, semi-fictional conversations on Lambda Moo um, and other collaborative story-making text-based platforms. Uh, um, yeah, but you I also guess. but oh, you, you also do you also undertake research into the kind of geographic spaces that you're working in. I think that's what's really interesting to me for Ghostfield is that even it, in you know and even the daily the etherpad writings that you're contributing to daily ritual, I can see this kind of non-linear nature of your writing practice. I wonder if you might talk to how you find ways of weaving these you know both personal, political scientific and fictive narratives together with one another? Mm. Uh, I think it's quite intuitive and uh, maybe a, a good word to describe it is emergent. Like, so there are 
emergent narratives that come out of a process, which actually, Lenny, your words, I had to write them down, working a theme to death, basically. Uh -huh. I, take a theme and work it to death. And uh, that's what I think I, I do similarly. And But you don't know what is going to emerge out of that deep uh -huh kind of focus going down yeah going down Alice's uh, rabbit hole and so the the connection so but being on uh, Rottnest Island the Aboriginal name of which is Wajamup I had no idea when I uh, went for the residency that it was Australia's largest deaths in custody site in terms of the Aboriginal population uh, from uh, in Western Australia so, you know, everything you learn about being uh, in a place then weaves itself into the narrative, um, which is what happened there. Plus, yeah, uh, during uh, the macro lab, lab was all hooked up with what, what was quite new then, I guess, see you, see me cameras or something similar. And so people uh, were able to beam in, uh, you know, observe us, surveil us in the lab 24 hours a day. So some of what I was using uh, were um, still shots that friends had taken from the see you, see, you, see me stream and emails, etc. cetera. Uh, but you never, well, I guess I never know what, is going to be the outcome of a work out of that process of, um, yeah, complete immersion. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Amanda. It does in some ways. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that that concept of your immersion in a place as well as immersion in the work itself and that mm. those things always end up so intertwined. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and likewise, I mean, I'm quite old now, but the book that I'm working on, that's uh, there's fragments of it, changing fragments nearly every day um, on the Etherpad uh, in the gallery at CBA, but it's also accessible through a URL. That's also me learning about the... I was born in London, but I was raised in Adelaide, uh, Australia, since uh, from the age of two. So the older I get, the more I'm learning about, um, I guess, the geography, but more importantly, uh, the, the political and social history of the land on which I live, um, on which uh, my child was conceived, on which I buried my parents, uh, buried my grandchildren's placentas. So, uh, yeah, so the idea of place is coming through more and more strongly the older I get and the more I reflect on uh, what it is to live all your life almost in a place, but what it is to be an immigrant and what it is to be part of, um, you know, the British colonising people uh, of this land um, called Australia. I'm, I'm just about to drop the, um, the ether pad into the text. Yep which I think very beautifully and stolen from one of your grandchildren, I believe, in the sky, uh -huh. and I were flying, I imagined. Yeah. Is the name of the text piece. Um, do you want to describe your, I mean, you've been, you've been writing on that pad daily. Oh, that's a, mm. thank you very much for sharing the drawing by Francesca's uh, <laughs> granddaughter. Grand, granddaughter also um, that's in one of the zines. Do you want to describe the practice of, writing every day and, and how that's contributed, where that work is going as part of your writing practice? Yeah. Um, well, I, the last year or so I've been putting together a book of mainly essays, but also uh, poems and kind of prophetic visions and reflections. Uh, so that book, which until a week ago was called In the Sky, Nonna and I Were Flying, I Imagined, but now it's called Tongues of Quick and Silver. Uh, it's existing works. I've just been um, intuitively selecting parts every day for the, the show at CBA. But also last year I started working, uh, writing a, well, a new novel, novella has come out of that called Stinging Nettles. So over the last couple of weeks I've been putting some of that much newer writing in. Um, and that is very much about, yeah, the land, <laughs> the small quarter acre block on which I, I grew up and that my kids now live on, my grandkids live on. Um, so that 
that works called stinging nettles. Um, but yeah, every day uh, I've been getting up, burning uh, some sort of essential oil, playing music, usually some kind of uh, ambient music and selecting something out of one of those two books to paste in. And it's kind of exciting because you think that maybe no one's looking at it, maybe a couple of people are, but just thinking, ah, it has a potential public. It's very different from it being in my journal or in my, um, you know, my sprawling data chaos that's on my laptop. So bringing it out, uh, a partial birth into the world. Nice. Thank you very much. Do you want to give us a hint about what is what 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 we're, what we're going to be doing next Saturday? Oh, yeah. So um, uh, I like your term uh, that all of us artists in the show are serial collaborators. So one of the serial collaboration groups um, I've been working with, there's three of us, uh, we're called Identity Runners or ID Runners, and we've been working together. Uh, we met in New York uh, in about 98, we met, and I think we started working together in 99 or 2000. So Diane Luden, Agnese Trocchi and I, Diane is in Brooklyn, New York, Agnese is in Rome, and I'm in Australia. So transcontinental, uh, we have made for the last sort of two months, we've been working on a script. Uh, that we have now made into a soundtrack. It's quite poetic and it's a little bit sci-fi. So we've made that um, next week. We'll, we'll be broadcasting that. And we are inviting uh, anyone who's interested to jump on the Etherpad with us where we have the script and we want you to mess around with it. You know, you can cut it all out. You can put new stuff in. You can put your own reflections in. Uh, so it will be a live jam on the ether pad, but you don't have to do that. You can just put on some headphones and listen to the soundtrack, which goes for about 16 or 17 minutes. So it's our way of trying to be together, us three identity runners, also with an audience across at least three continents, if not more. Yay. Thank you very much for that tidbit for our program for next <laughs> Saturday. Um, Camilla, do you want to move maybe to... <coughs> Chloe's work <coughs> that wasn't about your work Chloe my deep apologies I mean it's okay if it was sometimes we <laughs> have to cough sometimes we have to cough and um, I love this work by Chloe and I live with the text poster that is the unlimited edition that you can take away with you if you manage to come down to visit us at the gallery um, I have it on my wall on my wall Forgetting is essential to survival, even the good stuff. There's just too much of it. Um, it's a beautiful, it's a really lovely text and I'd encourage you all to read it if you can. Um, say nothing, say lifeline, say want me, say haunted, say death. It reminds me in lots of ways of some of the text that was coming out of Francesca's writing as well. So I think there are really nice confluences between your work there, although very different circumstances in which they were written. Um, Chloe, you described Sky No Filter as an Instagram project that started as a way of marking time and investigation of digital seeing. That's what you say on your website. And that it quickly became something else entirely. It became a chronicle of a period when you as a Black American became increasingly agoraphobic and traumatised by the deluge of news and information we were getting about the murders of unarmed black people in America. Um, and I do remember spending time with you looking at the sky, though perhaps not a photo that ended up in your Instagram feed um, during that period. And the very personal text that um, has resulted in the, in the chat book that we're exhibiting here, um, a wonderful text about abstraction and empathy, but they also waft between diary entry and personal musings. I wonder how you came to transition the photo work into a video and text-based piece. Yeah, so, I mean, the photos and the text um, 
were never separate once text was introduced into the photos, right? It started with just the photos. So I was, I was going outside, I had this phone, my phone had a camera. I was curious about how my phone's camera could see the color blue. Um, I just wanted to know, like, I, I didn't really, there was no right answer, there was no wrong answer, I just wanted to know. And so what I was doing is anytime that I could get a kind of uninterrupted perfect square of sky, I would just take the picture and I would mark it with where I was and the time of day. And I would post that on Instagram and people didn't actually even register them exactly as photos because they looked like just colored squares. Um, they're colored squares with slight variation if you look closely and some of them have more obvious variation than others. But if you're scrolling quickly through a digital platform, you just sort of see this colored square and it's different from what you would usually see which does present itself as a photo more clearly. And then as I was kind of taking these pictures, a lot of stuff was always happening around me personally and especially politically um, that was really quite troubling. And so I started writing texts that basically anything that had happened personally or politically um, on the day where I was taking the photo or around the time, maybe I had just found out about something when I was taking the photo and I would write a short text about that. And so I would post the text and the photo together which is something that Instagram, of course, allows for and encourages, right? So I was going with the format that I had in front of me to do something different, to do something a bit slower, to do something um, that's not very viral. Uh, it has low viral potential, um, to do something that it took people a long time to even recognize that I was doing it. Um, and once they figured it out, they got really, really excited. And kind of the rate of time that it took them to figure it out varied really widely and that was interesting to me because uh, I liked what was said about potential publics, right? Social media is a kind of always potential public and especially for me on Instagram, um, I'm not that careful about people I know versus people I don't know because I post very little that's personal. So it's a potential public of people that are more invested in what I post than they are in me personally. And so I like activating that group of people to slow down or to think in different ways or just to see how they respond to certain types of aggregation. And so this was, I guess, kind of the first of what wound up being a series of projects that premiered in that way. Um, there was like, I, I question whether it was the first because I did a joke project with my cat called, have you seen my cat? I can't find him anywhere. And in every, every photo was just a photo of my cat hiding really poorly. Um, so you could always see him, but he thought you couldn't. Uh, but that was not like really an artistic work. It was just kind of a joke thing. But since then, I've done several much more serious projects that have uh, used the Instagram platform in various ways. I see your cat you hiding my cat. really the worst ever. Yeah, it's the worst he's hide I've really ever seen He's in a my really life. bad hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Luther Tevin is really bad at hiding. He's in everybody's face. Um, um, one of the things that I really love about seeing the book as a projection of Chloe is that you walk into the gallery and you see a blue square and you think there's nothing going on there. And the changing of the blue happens so quietly and slowly, but then it's suddenly quite different. And I think that's really a, a really beautiful object, uh, aspect of, of seeing that work in the gallery space. Do you want to hint to us where this body of work is going next, Chloe? Yeah, I have no problem explaining that. Um, so, you know, a lot of my work begins in digital places or begins in uh, through certain types of social practice, community engagement conversations. Um, this piece actually, before it was a chapbook, the entire text of the chapbook in a slightly different version was a lecture performance. Um, it's been slightly edited for the chapbook to make the chapbook sound better, which I think was the right thing to do. But you basically get the idea of the lecture performance if you read mm -hmm. the chapbook. Mm -hmm. But ultimately the manifestation of this project was always that I was gonna make a sundial um, it's uh, what's called an analemic sundial, which uses the human body as the nomen that tells the time. So the human body casts the shadow to mark the time. So it's a sundial that requires your participation in order to be functional. And uh, it, there are 18 panels in the sundial um, arranged in a kind of loose, uh, not full ellipsis, but as if you're marking an entire ellipsis and you just kind of cut off for like the back third. Um, because those times of day are night and you can't cast a shadow to tell the time at night. Sundial needs the sun, it also needs you. 
Um, and I will be finally making that sundial for the California African American Museum later this year, 2022. So a project that started in 2016 um, took a physical form in my brain on my studio wall in 2017. It will be physical and activated in 2022, which is really a dream. Lovely. Thank you so much, Chloe. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everybody. It's so great to, to be with your work. Camilla, maybe we can move over to Susan's, well, uh, Susan's work next. So here you can see Susan's work installed on the wall is also, like I say, I think there's really nice resonances between Chloe's work, which is kind of quietly poetic and has minimal changes in it until you can't, until it changes to these really beautiful works that are intended in some ways as mail art or as this kind of really intimate exchange that we've um, hung on the walls here where there's really lovely quiet poems and I've loved seeing how absorbed people work, pe how absorbed people get into the works when they can look at them closely. Um, but Susan, one of the things I'm really interested in, I would, I, I hope that some of you can get to the gallery to see the works at least, because they're really such beautiful, poetic, quiet works that they're much nicer in person. Um, but Susan, lots of artists have a journaling or college practice to kind of loosen up their hand, as it were, before embarking on studio work um, as a collage practice or a thinking practice. And we've heard some of those ideas from Lenny and Francesca and Chloe already. Um, and I've heard you describe your studio work as a space in which you have a deep conversation with yourself. Where, you, where your book art and your shirt poem mumbles are a welcome conversation with others. Um, but for some about 30 years now, you've been choosing to sh share your poem mumbles with small numbers of friends or collaborators, either as mail art or more recently as, this, uh, as email art. And why has this been important and how does this sharing of small moments of your work then inform your work in the studio is the question I'd like to ask of you. Well, I think uh, one thing that means a lot to me is the, the sharing of thoughts with people I care about. And uh, so the poems are just mumbles about, about uh, things you're feeling or seeing or, or reading or whatever and it's just a lovely habit I've done it for many years now and, uh, my ones that go out over the internet are uh, about about uh, maybe 30 people are, are received the day and that it's just a way of reaching out to the people I think about and care about. It's very, very special. Doesn't, you know, a, a small amounts of words reflecting the image with the words. It's, uh, it's just a happy habit. <laughs> And actually, I, I, I was actually Alex who designed the, the catalog, is the, or is it the process of designing the catalog, I draw a beautiful connection between this piece that Camillo is show, showing us now and the wonderful spine that's in the image in Francesca's work. So I was really interested in finding there are really nice connections between the shapes and the forms that uh, each of you are exploring. Um, Susan, can you talk a little bit about how this particular practice then informs your studio practice or how they feed on and off one another? Well, uh, all my life I've been very interested in writing and words. And I've also, of course, been 90% a visual person. And it's just fun to put the two, the two journeys together. <laughs> 
And for those of you who are fortunate enough to be able to make it to the gallery, one of the things that you've done with reproductions of, of these works is put together really in the, in the um, reading room section of the gallery that's right at the entrance, you've put together a whole range of different uh, kind of publications of different ways of navigating your way through each of the stories, different narratives, arcs that end up in the stories. Some of them have been with family, some of them have been with studio, with your, you know, your studio colleagues. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the process of selecting those works to tell stories? Well, a lot of my poems are, are people have moved with me with things they're thinking about or things they're doing. And I love reflecting on other people's uh, verbal journeys, visual journeys. And it's just a very sweet habit. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And Camilla, if you could just have a quick look at that beautiful handbook that's in the cabinet too. So I believe the very first poem mumble was sent to Anders Thunberg, and this is a book that you then collaborated with him on that's called The Handbook, some beautiful works in that. I do hope that some of you can get along to the gallery to see this work too. Also, I want to say that uh a publisher that I've worked with deeply and happily is Vincent Fitzgerald. Yeah. We've done maybe 10 books together and uh, they're, they, they're handled very beautifully and with such a feeling for material and elegance and everything. So I feel very blessed by being one of his uh, it's people he works with. A serial it's collaborator. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we don't have one of his books in the show, but that would be wonderful at some time. So maybe, Camilla, I can get you to move over to Adrienne Watzell's work. So the installation in the gallery here includes 18 of Adrienne's drawings and 20 of the books that she produced and then a video projection of animations of those drawings that was done by Joshua Tuthill and an AR app. And while I'm chatting with Adrienne, I might try and see if there's any way that Camillo can show us some of those animations in the AR app. But while we're getting Camillo to look at the work in this way, maybe Adrian, one of the things that I'd like to talk to you about in a bit, and oh look, here we are, we're looking at Joshua's. Um, so they're Adrian's drawings, but Joshua has then worked with her to make animations of the various drawings. But Adrian, how did you become so interested in researching Alberta Sieber's cabinet of natural curiosities? Um, well, among artists, I don't know anybody who isn't really. Um, it was a way of creating a world just like we create virtual worlds now uh, and, and a world that should command awe because you would get these very rare and exotic and sometimes natural and sometimes unnatural historical specimens and you would form a collection of your own very private and, and uh, uh, particularly uh, during the 18th century, it, it was something that people um, showed off and were very, very proud of. And this one was in particular just a, an incredibly um, wonderful series. It's a book called Seba's Net, uh, Cabinet of Natural Curiosities. And I always loved them. So what happened is the two things happened simultaneously but separately. I, I started writing a diary, uh, which was more like a litany of some, some neurotic 20th, 21st century artist living in an urban environment who is questioning everything. And, um, and then I realized that uh, it was intolerable to ask people to read it. 
because it went on and on and on. Uh, for instance, uh, there are passages about what makes somebody good or somebody evil. And, uh, and it talks about Albert Schweitzer who did all this wonderful work and won the Nobel Prize for peace. And then um, and when he was older, they said, you know, the hospital in Africa that you made, it's falling apart. It's completely deteriorated. And he said, it's fine for them. So was he good or was he evil or was he both? Of course, you know, but it ponders all this information, uh, historical information, personal information. And it's the third book I've made. Um, the first uh, book, the second book was all the same thing where all the text was submitted to an algorithm. So it, it was scrambled paragraphs of things written over a period of 20 years. And at the same time I started this text, I started doing these drawings. And what I would do is trace the outlines and then recombine them. Oh, you can see the animations. They work in the book and on the drawings also. And um, so the drawings became, uh, just fun, wonderful to do. And like I was emulating the 18th century and especially where the creature was not exactly something you would absolutely find in nature. Um, and then I started superimposing the drawings onto the text. In the drawings that you see now, the, the text shows through the drawings about 80% opacity, they're done on translucent paper and they're overlaid physically onto the text. So you could possibly read underneath. When I did the books, I decided that I wanted it to be completely opaque because it creates a constraint in literature, like, you know, like the Olipo group I created constraints, like Twitter creates constraint of 140 characters and you read around the images. Now, in each of the 20 books, the images are applied differently to the same text uh, through an algorithm. So every book is completely different and provides a different reading. When you read around the images, I, I find it hilarious. I would like to know if any, you know, everybody else does um, because it's kind of like this really intense personal selfie talk um, and uh, of an obviously mature person, well, in some senses. And um, it's, uh, by being cut short, you surmise what's under the image if you want to, but you don't really have to because cutting across and having these phrases pop up is, the only way I can describe it, it's hilarious. It's a very rich text. And together to me, they form like a, a different kind of electronic literature uh, in print. But um, also it's sort of like if you're, if you're in a, a virtual world and I did a lot of work in a moose in multi uh, object oriented uh, dungeons things. Which is what um, we were talking about with Francesca yeah, and yeah, Landon. Yeah, Francesca, yeah. yes. And um, I did a lot of those creating characters and there was always this conflict of who am I? Am I this character? You know, I am this male misogynist person I'm acting out or am I me or am I? And in this book, it's almost like the merger of the images and the text um, create a, a, a merger, you know, it superimposes the avatar upon the real person or maybe it's super, super it's the other way around but um i don't know if anybody knows what i'm talking about but the, you know the the unreality of uh a character you create that you act out as we're all performers now because we're all so visible everywhere and there's no place to hide um so uh I lost track of what I say. But anyway, I was, I've always been interested in char creating characters. Um, in the 90s, I had Muse Eleanor. And Muse Eleanor was a muse who claimed responsibility for all great 
artists' ideas from ancient Egypt through the Renaissance. And she was uh, sure to tell Giotto that when he got the arena chapel, you know, to do, she said, well, it's too bad you didn't design it, but I think you should make little small panels, you know, and then she claims credit and she's incredibly annoying. Um, and she, she got to be interviewed in a, a lot. Nobody wanted to talk to me. Everybody wanted to talk to me, Miss Eleanor. So I like that idea of characters becoming real. Mm. So, so so what, 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 what is the relationship then between the text and the images? Only the self. In other words, the images, it says see no evil. It's called see no evil. So that there isn't any literal connection at all. But it has to do with the perception of things as creatures and a perception of us and our souls as creatures. And then the delineation of it in text which is, you know, language is a very specific thing. I mean, especially since I only speak English, really, my French is unbearable. So um, I know it's very limited, even though it's a very expansive language and can express almost anything. I don't know if I answered your question. Well, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if, Camilla, you can pull back to the, have a sweep of the gallery space. And I wonder if any of the artists want to ask questions of one another or whether we can open up the floor to conversation. So I we love can ask a question if, yeah, if there isn't one, because um, what, what Adrian just said about the sort of possibility within limitation or the possibility within restraint obviously appeals to me very much, but I'm wondering if that appeals to anyone else, that even as we're making these expansive collections, that there's a possibility within limitation in a certain way. Francesca, do you want to speak to that? Because I know that you set rules sometimes that maybe you're aware of providing limitations to some of the work you're doing. Oh, you're muted. And we've been chatting uh, a little bit about that. Yeah. How do you uh, set sorry. constraints or limitations? Ah. Uh. Oh, it's just so fun. You just write yourself a rule and then you follow it. It's so good, especially when you don't have any ideas. You can write any rule. I was just looking at some of my rules for writing and uh, the other day, and it can be as simple as uh, go to your bookshelf, close your eyes, you know, take off nine books, then open each one to page 33 and uh, write down a phrase that jumps out at you. And that begins to build a text. I, I love constraints. I don't know I, if I answered I the question. I love breaking them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that too. I, mean, I, I always remember, you know, like a quote from Richard Diebenkorn about start a work as far away as your normal style is because you'll always return home. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks, Chloe, for keep starting the conversation. Does anybody have a, any of the other artists have a question they'd like to pose? Francesca. Uh, yeah, I had a question for Lenny about um, uh, using some of the words that your wife had said that, um, or your memories of those words. And I asked also because I use quite a lot of um, what I remember my mum saying, but when she was in states of mania, really, throughout my childhood. So do you ever have um, a dilemma about that? What can be very private or someone is in that altered state? Or how did you work through that? Or indeed, if you had to. Um. The privacy never really uh, was a problem for me. Um, you know, like a lot of Noni sayings can be taken many ways. Some, some of them were 
quite personal, but some of them were just very funny. And um, um, the, the watercolors are not illustrations for the words. They kind of coexist. And, and sometimes I would connect up a watercolor to what I thought was a related saying. But um, yeah, I mean, when I first was putting the book together, I showed it to some friends and they thought it was too, too personal to publish. And, um, and that never really was, for some reason, that never was a problem for me. I mean, I, I, I felt that they, that they had a quality outside of, of the intimacy of our relationship. And, um, you know, and I just wanted, you know, like, I wanted to give Noni credit for who she was. And in many ways, these, ex these sayings um, express that. And, you know, and, and then the watercolors, I had no plan with the watercolors. I mean, they just happened. And, and then they kept feeding on, it, on themselves. And then at one point it just became obvious that the words and, and the watercolors should be connected. But in terms of the privacy thing, um, I'm a storyteller. And some of my best stories are about my family and about me and, um, and so this was another way of telling a story. It, it was like combining her words and my pictures was a kind of visual memoir. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Lenny. That's super useful and interesting. I know. I've been seeing you publish some of the text by your mother on the Etherpad over the last while. And I do recall that incredibly beautiful video of white that you made with um, Josephine Stars many years ago about your mom's illness and mania that I mm. think it's you know how you share those ideas and what's you know how, how you share memories is really important it's one of the things that I found com particularly compelling about Lenny's work was that mm. I did see it as a memorial in lots of beautiful ways but also as a collaboration right yeah I I see it as a collaboration and uh and besides my introduction there are three introductions by people who knew Noni and, and had some relationship with her. And, um, you know, and so also the, the book was to give as, as, as good a picture that I could of no, Noni within this context. Thank you. Well, maybe for the last part of the conversation, we could open it up to the floor. If anybody from the audience has questions that they would like to ask of any of the artists individually. Thank you, Laura, for your work on the book. Laura's jumping off now, so she doesn't have a question. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Laura. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I have a question. Kimberly I'm, and Bob. I'm, yeah, I'm Lenny's daughter and Noni is my mom. And um, so I just have a question. I'm noticing that there's a lot of, um, I'm really interested in uh, a lot of the work here has a random element to it that the medium itself, like the algorithm or the watercolor or the, I, I heard it in, in, you know, the sky, I heard it in several of the works here. And I just, Wanted to just uh, hear your thoughts on how you, um, you know, letting the medium randomly shape the work. So it's not exactly a question, but just curious about your thoughts, artists. Well, for me, um, my structure is really ha has come from jazz, and and that I see my work as kind of. Ha having a head, which is the melody, the theme, and then total improvisation, and then returning to re returning to the theme, and, and and so that's been like a working structure for me. So I improvisation and accidents and and letting the material um, shape the image has always been very important to me. I like that jazz connection. Well, you know, having 6,000 jazz vinyl albums, you know, you know. I've done studio visits with Lenny. It was like, I was in awe of his jazz <laughs> record collection. So. Does anyone else have any comments? I, I actually think, 
I'm going to say in some ways for me, Kimberly, it's less the medium than the process. Like it's not, I don't think the artists have allowed a medium or a media or a medium itself to inform that, but I think the artist process is open to diving in and see what comes in some ways. But the process dictates the outcome of the work rather than the medium. I don't know how others, how you artists feel about that. Yeah. Adrienne is waving. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that it was interesting because the one constraint I couldn't figure out was when to stop. I mean, I could have gone on and on and on. Uh, the text is 200 pages as it is. It was edited 21 times by me. Um, and, uh, I, and also with the drawings because it's an endless, in bottomless pit and well I shouldn't put it that way I mean it's like a cornucopia endless cornucopia of um of potential and I think a lot of artists do I'd be interested in other artists saying how they feel about that idea of when to stop um it's not like you really complete anything you stop and in the beginning with media art, it was because nobody could finish anything. Everything that was showing was broken in the 90s, you know, and, uh, because the technology wasn't up to the artist at that time sometimes. So anyway, who is going to say something? The individual piece, uh, well, mainly the stopping has always been a kind of exhaustion. <laughs> when you absolutely have nothing, you have nothing more to say on that particular piece or that particular series and you're just exhausted with it. Um, that's a good point. That's a good place to stop. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, when something becomes um, visibly or tangibly horrible uh, when you're gone. <laughs> that, 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 so that happened to us identity runners. We were writing that script for two months according to a series of rules. Then we added a, a final two rules and we started trying to execute them, but it made the script really horrible. So it was just like, okay, stop, wind it back. Uh, we were writing on Etherpad. So, you know, wind it back a few versions and that's where we'll stop because uh, we'd gone too far. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's another thing when I feel I've started to make mistakes, you know, where something was good and I just messed it up or lost it. Good, good time to stop. Yeah. So some people push through that. So, so it's like different people doing different things, you know. Chloe, you, you led with a question about constraints and I think you're quite, good at putting constraints in place that limit where the edges of things might be. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'm not naturally a maker. So I think sometimes in order to do anything, I sort of need to say like, well, I'm gonna do this and there's gonna be this number of it and then I'll be done. Um, and that's just a helpful way to get started for me. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're used to working more experientially and less physically or less yeah. materially, like it helps you to get over your fear. But you know, in terms of performance and other types of experiences, I've also put limitations in place in the past. I do so less now. Um, mm. And those limitations were weirder and they were not about fear at all. It was like, how many ways can I have a very similar for me experience with a bunch of different people and convince them that they're having a totally different experience every time, even though I'm following a script and they don't know it, right? Or, you know, um, yeah, something like that. I can't think of another one right now, but I've done things like that in the past that are less relevant to the way I practice in the present. But with Sky No Filter, one thing that happened was I never knew when I was going to stop doing the project. Um, and I think in that sense, right, there were a lot of constraints and limitations or specificities about the work, but I never said, oh, I'm going to do this for a year. And then at the end of doing it for a year, the Brooklyn Museum said, hey, you know, come do a, a performance. You know, what are you working on? And I said, well, I can do a lecture performance of this, of this project I've been working on for exactly a year. And they were like, oh, how 
how great. And so I thought maybe that would be an ending. And so I wrote a script as if it was an ending and then it wasn't, right? And remaining open to that I still wanted to be doing it um, and breaking out of the constraint was also a very good moment for me. Thank you, she said, unmuting herself. Um, do we have another question from the audience? No additional questions from the audience? I'd like to just conclude by saying thank you very much for your fabulous conversations and your contributions to the exhibition. I am still, the, the exhibition's still up for three weeks. I'd be thrilled to welcome anybody there. But I guess, you know, our, one of the things that's been super interesting for me in this context is that I have found my um, own background and thoughts into technology and art bleeding in and out of this exhibition in so many different ways that were in some ways accidental because I did pose an exhibition of book art to the centre of book art and I thought about storytelling techniques that each of you were drawing on. Um, I initially began the conversation with Lenny and Adrian and Susan about book projects that they were working on and then was compelled to think about the very poetic ways that Chloe had been thinking about time and the book that she did that in some ways was part of partly resulted from your residency at the Centre for Book Arts. Um, and then I had to be drawn back to the work of Francesca, whose work we do look at in the class that I teach at Hunter College, because I think looking back on those very early web works important and the narratives of it. But I wonder if any of you have any concluding remarks about books and narrative and how they relate to your practice as artists, not as documentation of your work, but as part of the practice of making art. <laughs> what has compelled you to make book art as part of your practice? Um, well this is Susan. I've always worked with words and been interested in words. I'm a James Joyce enthusiast. And so putting, uh, making a relationship between word and image is extremely wonderful for me. I, I, didn't really make books before I I illustrated not so much illustrated but but had some of my images used in books by poets and and I did covers for for various poets uh, Steve Cowett Stephen R Rodifer um, and and this book I mean the these watercolors and Noni sayings just said this is a book. And, and, and then Laura, um, when she saw them, she very much said, this is a book. And, and, and that's how, how that came about. Mm, I don't really have an answer, but what just popped into my head is um, a few years ago, some new uh, fragments of poems by the Greek poet Sappho appeared and they were uh, found on the papyrus on the mummy, the lining of a mummy case. And these were words of Sappho's, that, you know, because we've got most of her words only exist in fragments. So I'm just wondering if that also is a kind of a book, the lining uh, on papyrus of a, yeah, an Egyptian mummy, mummy of this fantastic Greek poet Sappho. I don't think my work's ever going to end up like that. <laughs> but I do love your scenes. Adrienne. Thank you. I love the idea of, you know, reading and subtext um, all my life. But uh, I was devastated to 
find out the contents of the Rosetta Stone. It's, it's actually a PR work thanking the Pharaoh for lifting taxes from the priest's lands. And uh, there probably were Rosetta Stones all over everywhere because they had to praise and they can that and say that from now on this day will be a holiday for that pharaoh for lifting the taxes on the i mean to me it was devastating because it was such a poetic visual image right three languages till it was deciphered <laughs> <laughs> you know then it was like no no it can't be. <laughs> but so that sort of disguise and non-disguise is fascinating to me um and meaning and how books look and also the fact that i read them on my ipad now because i'm allergic to all my old books they've gotten moldy you know from i should that's so personal that's but sad. no you know they've gotten old and they're like i sneeze if i open them up the dust comes up you know so anything I want to reread, I'm actually getting on my iPad and reading it electronically now. I love books. That's so. sad. I love books. I have Chloe, a do you, do you have a complete? Do you have anything you'd like to finish up with, Chloe? I like turning pages. I love turning pages. I love a book. And it's been a total pleasure to work with each of you and each of your books. Uh, I, I've been carrying around Sky No Filter in my pocket for weeks now. And I hate it when I read it on the subway because then I can't see the sky. I need, I need to, I need to, I need to um, travel on subways that go overground, not underground. The first time <laughs> I was reading it, when I was reading the catalogue essay, I was on, the, on a commute from Bronx to Brooklyn. I was being instructed by you to look at the sky and I was going, but I can't. It felt like impossible to have that instruction. Um, thank you, Chloe, Francesca, Susan, Adrienne, Lenny. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you for a lovely conversation. Um, I really enjoyed being in conversation with you and I love spending time with each of your work as well. Um, I hope that Daily Ritual proposes some of these questions and I'm be delighted to welcome people to meet me at the gallery if you're able over the next three weeks while it's still up. Um, I'd also like to just say that this wouldn't be possible without the Centre for Book Arts. Um, their support of me and all of your work in developing this exhibition has been astounding um, in all sorts of different ways. This is an exhibition that's been a very long time in the making. Thank you, COVID-19. Um, and so it's been a pleasure to work with you all. I would like to thank Camillo for showing us around the gallery and for introducing me. Um, Karina Reynolds, the uh, director of the Centre for Book Arts for um, inviting me, commissioning me to make this work. Zoe Katz, Elspeth Pence, can, uh, Pan Crazy, Fan Kong for helping us put together the public program, Emily Maranka, Sarah Morgan for all of your fabulous promotion of it, Gillian Lee for putting together such a really terrific show uh, um, um, in the curated section of the, of the Library Art Fund, Alison Carter Boyle for helping them with editing for the essay that's for the that's coming forth. Everybody at the Centre for Book Arts, your support has been amazing realising this project. I'd also like to thank Jenna Hammond for her early support when um, she initially invited me to um, come and work with them. And finally, I'd like to thank Alex Pentecost Farron for, as the designer for the catalogue that's forthcoming, for also helping me to trigger um, image relationships and between each of your work, but it's been a really lovely collaborative. Um, process. So thank you, Camillo. Thank you, Centre for Book Arts. And thank you, for Amanda, for putting the show together. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, Amanda, yeah. and everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Centre for Book Arts, is there any anyone on the team that needs to say a thank you and goodbye? Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Camillo. Cheers, everyone.